Richard, in Cosmos and Psyche, you examined planetary alignments throughout history. You focused systematic attention on four pairs of outer planets, Uranus-Pluto, Saturn-Pluto, Jupiter-Uranus, and Uranus-Neptune. You had some very interesting things to say about other planetary combinations, but not in such detail. Do you plan to do a historical study of the other six pairs of outer planets, such as Jupiter and Saturn? Yes, actually, uh, my plan is uh, to put... Um, I have several other books I hope to write before I'm done with this lifetime, and one of them is to complete uh, the process that I began with Cosmos and Psyche. So I'd actually like to have a book that covers all 45 combinations. All f there's 45 planetary pairs. Um, now some of those, like let's say Venus-Mars, or uh, Mercury-Venus, or Mars-Jupiter, will not have as much relevance to the, to the world transit cycles. Mm -hmm. They'll be much more relevant to uh, uh, personal, to the individual level. Mm -hmm. and uh, in that sense, um, I will be covering, I, I would like to give an, an adequate number of compelling examples from uh, the historical figures, major cultural figures that everyone has a sense for, you know, who they are, you know, like Virginia Woolf or, you know, Winston Churchill or um, uh, Martin Luther King, and to show how, uh, to take any given planetary combination and show how it plays out in major figures' lives in their <coughs> natal charts, also in personal transits. But then there are the, uh, the rest of the outer planet combinations, which I just, I just gave a little bit of a sense for, um, for example, the, the Saturn-Uranus combination. Um, I talked about it a bit uh, in, in Cosmos and Psyche, but I didn't give it the full kind of 90-page treatment that I mm. gave to Uranus, Pluto, or um, Saturn, Pluto, and so forth. So I will, with those other outer planet combina combinations, give a, a, a more systematic um, historical overview at, a, in, in the long run. Yeah. The ancients uh, used Jupiter, Saturn, and that was the best they could do yes. in terms of slow moving. Yes. What kind of energies would we expect to see in the Jupiter, Saturn cycles? Well, it's, it's the combination of the uh, on the one hand, the impulse for contraction and uh, you know, grounding and, and limit uh, and tradition and so forth that Saturn represents, and the Jupiterian impulse towards towards expansion and wider horizons and and uh, elevation and so forth. And also, both of these have a lot to do with. Um, they actually overlap a lot at the level of cultural, social um, codes, mor moral and ethical codes, judicial co codes, um, the uh, area of jurisprudence, uh, the law, and organizational structures that affect a society, uh, bureaucratic structures, and so forth. And so we typically see it, it's not as dramatic an archetypal complex as, let's say, you know, Uranus Pluto, where you've got you know just these major epochs of cultural convulsion and political revolution and and innovation cover you know basically across the board. It's not it, it it doesn't have that kind of quality, nor the same as say the the Jupiter Uranus combination, which is so regularly coincident with uh, periods of roughly about fourteen months each time. Uh, uh, that they come into conjunction or opposition, you get these quite dramatic awakenings of of cultural and uh, cultural innovation and rebellions and and so forth. That's because the, the that Uranian principle is so electric, it's so uh, exciting, it stimulates cultural activity in unpredictable, innovative ways that break the surface of of the status quo. Jupiter and Saturn are much more, um, uh, you know, they're 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 a little more restrained and they're a little more more operating in a in a kind of continuous uh, mode rather than with with that 
eruptive potential of so, the Uranus and Pluto. So they're going to be harder to pick out. Uh, yeah, the although act, oh, sorry, pick out of the historical timeline. Yeah. There, I mean, they, the patterns are definitely there, mm -hmm. and the ancients, as you say, that was their; those were their outermost planets, mm -hmm. and they did a great deal of work using them within the context of the signs and moving and uh, and, and through the through Mutations. the elements and the yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And uh, Jung actually discusses that himself mm -hmm. in in uh, in his work, uh, particularly as he was trying to nail down what was going on around the birth of Christ mm -hmm. and that. that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that occurred very close to that time. Uh, <clears throat> so they were able to, by by drawing on the larger, a larger focus on the signs, the elements, the gradual movement of the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction every 20 years through uh, through the um, the elements and through the signs. They were to be able to get a kind of large picture and. Someone like Charles Harvey, who was the pres president of the British Astrological Association and who actually was born in the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, he, he did some very good research with the Jupiter-Saturn cycle in, in a, uh, his book um, called Mundane Astrology. Uh, and so also did uh, a, uh, someone named um, André Barbeau, the um, French mundane astrologer. So there has been a good work done in that area with Jupiter Saturn which which does definitely pick out major cycles it has also to do with um, certain kind of shift in authority figures regi regime change mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. that that would be worth talking about but again it's not at the same level of kind of epoch making uh, dramatic uh, shifts of consciousness that I was able to pinpoint uh, so uh, systematically with, mm -hmm. the, with those other outer planet combinations. Right. Um, astrologers are very familiar with the concept of synchronicity, and in Cosmos and Psyche you gave many illuminating examples of it. You also made use of the less familiar concept of diachrony. Would you explain diachrony as it applies to astrology and give a favorite example or two? Sure. Um, the, the basic uh, distinction between synchronic and diachronic is, of course, the synchronic uh, refers to an, uh, events that happen at approximately the same time. Diachronic describes something that is happening through time, across time, dia, uh, is the Greek prefix. And um, <clears throat> what I was pointing out is that if you take uh, the big, uh, a major outer planet cycle, such as the Uranus-Pluto cycle, um, it, for any given conjunction, you would have, or, or opposition, uh, you would have a period that lasts slightly more than a decade uh, that would just at, have a large number of events that would all have a similar archetypal character, reflecting the combination of the Uranian, Promethean, innovative, rebellious, uh, uh, catalyzing energies. Uh, associated with the planet Uranus, and then the Plutonic impulse that has so much to do with the tremendous uh, you know, empowerment, intensification, transformation, destructive energies, and, uh, and regeneration, and so forth. And you bring those two together, you'll get, uh, uh, at any given moment, um, you will have many events across many fields of human activity. Women's rights, civil rights, technology, artistic uh, uh, development, uh, political uh, movements, and so forth. Right across the board, you'll have many events happening at the same time that reflect that complex. That's synchrony. Uh, and then synchronistic brings in the added meaning that Jung gave to it, which has to do with that it's a coincidence of events that, ha that are united by their meaning, mm -hmm. not by a causal factor, uh, at least as, as we would usually understand the word cause. Now, diachronic uh, is what happens when you look at a series of axial alignments of the same two planets, such as the conjunction, then the next opposition, then the next conjunction, the next opposition, and show how there is a, 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 a sequence that within any given field, it seems to develop with a kind of um, new 
new expression of it, a new catalyzing of that same archetypal impulse within the same field that in some sense was either lying fallow in between the two alignments or it may have been developing but then when it gets to that next alignment it just uh, blasts forth with a whole new kind of quantum leap and so uh, this when I refer to diachronic patterns you know such as for example the 1960s would be the one the most recent Uranus Pluto um, conjunction period and with all the revolutionary uh, events and phenomena that connected to, let's say, um, women's rights uh, or uh, to um, the, the civil rights movement. And then uh, if we look back to the preceding, um, let's say, conjunction, the, go all the way back to the preceding conjunction of Uranus and Pluto, which happened in the late 1840s, early 1850s, you again had a major period of political revolutionary impulses right across the board. Um, in, in like every capital in Europe just about had a, had a revolution in 1848, early 1849. But again, if you even go more specifically, you can see that, for example, the women's movement that, that reached a, a peak of, of massive intensity in uh, beginning in the 1960s, under the preceding conjunction, was getting it, it was having its origins in with the 1848 gathering of the uh, the women's uh, uh, suffrage movement in uh, uh, New York with people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and uh, who basically initiated the women's movement that in many ways climaxed. A, uh, a century later, a little over a century later, with the very next conjunction. Same thing with the civil rights movement. You have Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Nelson Mandela, and so forth, all during the 1960s, um, being very active and huge amount of uh, uh, emancipatory activity. But you look back to the preceding conjunction period, and you have, again, um, that was the period when abolitionism was reaching its peak with um, the activities of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and John Brown. That's when Abraham Lincoln uh, joined the uh, the Republican uh, and the Republican Party was formed, and the that that basically was the one that led uh, oversaw the the emancipation of the slaves during the Civil War. So that was. Uh, uh, again, you just see these diachronic patterns through time. <clears throat> I was interested that you, in several places in the book and just now, refer to the conjunction as the climax. But typically, many of us have been thinking of the as the opposition of the climax of the cycle and the conjunction as the seed or beginning. Uh, do you have yes. some? Yes. Um, the research suggests, I, I was using the word climax uh, not as a um, term that would make the conjunction different than the opposition. For example, if, if we were, as I do in the book, I'm, being, I'm giving headlines here rather than the kind of more nuanced, comprehensive discussion that I do in the book. Uh, but if I were doing a very systematic um, uh, exposition of, of, the, of the correlations, I would be, I would be much more... Uh, carefully drawing how what everything that happened during the opposition, for example, um, when in, in each of those fields, whether we were talking about radical social movements during the during the opposition that happened between the two conjunctions, that's when um, uh, Lenin, for example, uh, wrote um, what is to be done, and uh, well, during the preceding conjunction, that's when Marx wrote and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto. And then during the 1960s, you have Marxism spreading, you know, right throughout the world with uh, quite uh, powerful intensity. And same thing with the women's movement, with the militant women's suffragists at the turn uh, in the in the uh, during the opposition of Uranus and Pluto, late 1800s, early 1900s. And um, same thing with the civil rights movement, with. Uh, uh, um, the Souls of Black Folk, for example, being being uh, written by uh, 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 Du Bois, and uh, uh, much more of a um, really the, the beginnings of what went, went to um, Martin Luther King's work 60 years later. Now, this uh, and the foundation founding of the NNAACP, for example, was at that time, and you know, any other phenomena that I give 
So that also was a climax. I found that the conjunction and the opposition and the next uh, conjunction, the next opposition, they each seem to bring a climax of the, um, of the archetypal energies that are always with us. I mean, they're, you know, those planets are always in the sky. Mm -hmm. They're always in everybody's natal charts. We all participate in them all the time to some extent. But it does seem that at the times of the big, really all the uh, um, major heart aspects, the quadrature alignments, conjunction, square, opposition, at each one of those, there seems to be an intensification of that archetypal complex in such a way that uh, it bursts forth in human experience with greater intensity. And in that sense, it kind of climaxes the preceding years when it was in a more um, uh, developing continuum, or sometimes, as I say, kind of underneath the surface and not really visible at all. And then there'll be just a real uh, bursting forth. So I'm using that word climax in a more generic sense. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there will come a time when people will, in, in the future, I think more be able to take all the all the alignments that I set out and distinguish what's a conjunction and what's an opposition in terms of one being a seed form, beginning it, uh, the birth of something, and then the next one, the opposition being more of a, uh, of a kind of, another kind of climax in the more traditional astrological mm -hmm. sense. But you can see how both can be seen as climaxes yeah, too. Each could be the climax of the, of the other. That's right. I, I'm, I'm gathering. Yes, exactly. Um, how about the squares of the cycles? Um, could you characterize uh -huh. those for us briefly? The squares are, uh, they're often just as, uh, as significant as the conjunctions and the oppositions. They don't, they, uh, I, they seem to coincide with the alignment, that is the events and, and the related cultural phenomena seem to coincide with the square within a, a, a smaller orb than the opposition and the, and the conjunction. Conjunction and opposition, it's, it's more like about a 15 degree uh, uh, alignment, which is the same as a um, new moon and a full moon appear to be new or full. The square seems to be a little bit more like about 10 degrees with these world transits. Mm -hmm. And in terms of their, their nature, they seem to be especially dynamic and challenging. Uh, you know, I think it, you know, it's as if the energy is coming at a right angle uh, to, or the, the two energies are coming at each other at a right, right angle, which tends to precipitate events in a very c concrete way. It, it's, it's, it can be quite uh, stressful, uh, but at the same time, the dynamism of it can be extraordinarily uh, productive, and I give a, a number of examples of how, um, when it's well assimilated by, by, let's say, a person who's born with the square, it's often one of the, the most fruitful uh, uh, achievements that uh, we especially admire um, for that particular archetypal combination. So mm -hmm. squares, they seem to demand more of us, but also be um, potentially a, a very, very uh, productive and even uh, life enhancing. And have you been able to get a, a definite sense of, of a transitional nature between opposition and conjunction of yes, squares? Yes, very much. Uh, and I give a number of examples uh, where, you know, for example, you'll have someone like, often the births of major figures in a given cultural stream will coincide with these, these big conjunctions and opposition and so forth. And you could take something like the, um, you could take something like Copernicus born under the Uranus-Neptune conjunction of the 1470s and 80s. And then under the next opposition, Galileo and Kepler are born. And then under the next conjunction, uh, Newton is born. So you've got this sequence of great, basically, astronomer visionaries who are looking at the Uranian sky with a new Neptunian intuitive vision of the whole, and they bring a, a kind of radical transformation of, of, of the cultural uh, cosmology. Through, um, and that's, each of those happen in a sequence, conjunction, opposition, conjunction. 
and then if we go to the if we were to then break down in ha halfway between, for example, the con the opposition that Galileo and Kepler were born under, halfway between that and the uh, conjunction that Newton was born under, exactly halfway in between at the square is when Galileo turns the telescope to the heavens, and um, the Copernican and scientific revolutions are just um, uh, impelled with great, you know, they're kind of catalyzed with quite, quite a bit of drama and stress, and it's like, you know, there's a, it was, that's really when it broke out into the cultural psyche much more, under the square, interestingly. So, so there was something enabling about the square? Yes. Of, of, the, of, the of what had already transpired yeah. earlier, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and then Newton consummates the whole sequence. Mm -hmm. Just as Newton consummates, he synthesizes Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo in one grand synthesis. Mm -hmm. So also, his, he's born under the conjunction that is one full cycle after the conjunction that Copernicus is born under. You see, so there's a mm -hmm. marvelous kind of symmetry to it. Right, right. Um, it seems to me that the real obstacle to the acceptance of astrology among scientifically inclined is not lack of evidence, but the fact that astrology cannot be made to harmonize with our still prevailing mechanistic worldview. The subtitle of Cosmos and Psyche is interesting in this regard. Intimations of a new worldview. Would you explain? Sure. I, well, I think you're quite right that I need First of all, the evidence is there, and you know, astrologers have known for a long time, uh, intimately, that there uh, is a, a tremendous amount of evidence for the person who knows what to look for, is, been, is informed with the proper methodology and so forth. Uh, the evidence is, is very compelling. But scientists are, like all human beings, they see through the lens that they have been trained to see through. And uh, there is a very human tendency to uh, basically avoid data that would conflict with the, stru the, the structure of one's worldview, the paradigm um, st structure that one has basically built one's career on, one's identity on, one's intellectual vision. So we tend to just say, um, what was that famous uh, uh, astronomer? who was grappling with the Gokulant statistical uh, evidence, and he just said the statistics are, because you know, as you know, the Gokulant mm -hmm. evidence supported statistically certain astrological principles. And this uh, astronomer said, if statistics are made to prove astrology, I no longer believe in statistics. Mm -hmm. um, to his credit, Hans Eysenck, the, the another you know, very rigorous and skeptical uh, scientist, said, Emotionally, I do not want to uh, believe the Gokland evidence. It makes me very uncomfortable. But intellectually, I know I must. I, I know it's, it, it stands up. It's, it's very uh, uh, compelling. Now, the reason I use the word uh, intimations of a new worldview is that I, the word intimations has a different ring than the word, let's say, you know, evidence or proof, especially the word proof. Um, People who are, are sophisticated in philosophy of science know that we actually never prove anything. What we do is we give sufficient amount of data to um, open us up to a new hypothesis and a new theory with which we then engage the complexity of, of, of reality through that lens and then we test those hypotheses and those theories. <clears throat> but no matter how many times you have a particular theory um, seemingly confirmed by the evidence, you don't know for sure whether it will cover all um, the data in the future, because the future is unpredictable. Uh, this is a, what's called the problem of induction that David Hume first pointed out. But I also was making a point about the kind of evidence I was, I was setting out, which is um, I ultimately believe that the, the universe gave us these extraordinary, this extraordinary kind of orchestration of patterning between the movements of the heavens and the patterns of human experience 
in such a way that it in, it requires the human uh, contribution. It's not going to be something that is just going to be uh, thrown at us with the force of a of a of a computer uh, printout that says in black and white, this is the way it is. The, s the same way one might get a statistical evidence out of a you know testing a drug uh, to see how uh, effective it is with a, a particular disease. It's not going to. I don't think the evidence is going to have that character. And the biggest reason for that is that the basic principles of meaning that inform these orchestrated synchronicities, uh, those principles are archetypal, and that means they are fundamentally multivalent. They, they um, express themselves through a multiplicity of possible uh, modes in, in different concrete ways. Saturn can express itself in terms of tradition or the past or age or old age or, or, or difficulties or burdens, but also um, discipline and, and the, the, the contraction of a highly focused consciousness but also it can be um, the sense of oppression or depression and, and so forth. There's so many ways in which you know, Saturn is the skeleton, Saturn is lead, Saturn is weightiness, heaviness, gravitas, gravitas of moral character, but also gravity in terms of a literal physical way. All those are Saturn, and we can't, an, an archetype has this metaphorical richness of meaning that really only a, a a poetically, imaginatively uh, cultivated intelligence can grasp. And going about this, trying to adduce evidence statistically, is really going at it the hard way, I would think. And it's uh, going over to the prevailing paradigm rather than treating uh, astrology in its own terms. I think, I think you're quite right there, because there's a tendency to want to um, uh, there's a tendency to feel that you need to um, prove your, your, your new ideas, or in this, this case sometimes ancient ideas, against the prevailing paradigm by using the prevailing paradigm's basic structures of assumptions, which in many cases doesn't work because, uh, as you say, the, the statistical mode of testing something, that works for very literal, concrete, um, variables mm -hmm. and factors, but the astrological variables and factors are far more nuanced and complex and, and multivalent and multidimensional, and they can really be, um, they can be cognized or, or apprehended only with the kind of intelligence with, which I think is ultimately not one that can be re reduced to a computer algorithm, but is ha the human factor involving our the, the imagination, the rigorous rational intelligence, and even the heart, uh, and also the aesthetic intelligence, the capacity to recognize aesthetic patterning. This is not something that uh, is going to be picked up readily by a computer program, um, a statistical uh, uh, methodology. So, and if I can just say one more thing about this, there's a tendency psychologically among, let's say, an insecure uh, astrological community to feel that they need to prove themselves to the father authority, <laughs> you know, patriarchal yes. science, so mm -hmm. to speak. And uh, it's, it's a losing game. And in a sense, the astrological community, I think, it would be best served and is being best served by um, undergoing a, a, a maturation within its own uh, development till it gets to the point of where it has assimilated the kind of rational and scholarly rigor that the scientists have had, and but they've added to it, that is within the astrological community, added to it a more nuanced uh, capacity for um, apprehending the, the archetypal patterning of existence, which is not something that uh, a scientist is trained to do, but it is something that a depth psychologist is trained to do, you know, for out of, you know, the Jungian 
even Freudian, uh, but particularly Jungian and archetypal psychological um, schools, have, as well as uh, in the realm of literature and poetry and literary criticism, uh, and also uh, the study of mythology, as with someone like Joseph Campbell, all of those fields have trained their uh, their scholars to be able to recognize the archetypal patterning, which is not, which is, so what I'm saying is, we need to uh, employ all our faculties, uh, as you mentioned, um, to be able to, not just the uh, narrowly understood rational intelligence, but the, the, imagine, the capacity for uh, imaginative rigor as well, as well as the, um, in fact, we can see all the different planetary archetypes in a sense reflect the different, um, the different human faculties. So it would be like the uh, Mercury, the, the, the rational intelligence, but also Venus, the aesthetic, the capacity for uh, apprehending aesthetic patterning, for example. And we need to draw on Neptune, which is much more the the uh, intuitive and imaginal capacity, and the the, the Iranian uh, sudden epiphany, the sudden awakening to to the higher mind, and so forth. And Saturn as rigor, as you mentioned. Um, in your history of Western philosophy, the passion of the Western mind, you seem to be able to immerse yourself in early philosophies to an extraordinary degree. Do you think that present-day philosophers of astrology can profit by revisiting earlier views of reality? Oh, I, I do very much. And I think many uh, contemporary astrologers are doing exactly that. I mean, certainly, you know, Robert Hand, uh, Robert Schmidt, um, uh, Jeffrey Cornelius, Charles Hardy, uh, uh, all have entered into ancient and medieval and Renaissance philosophical traditions. Uh, Robert Zoller is another one um, with great uh, uh, benefit. Particularly the Platonic tradition has so much to tell us uh, about the archetypal ideas and, and, the, um, and a, give it, giving us a kind of metaphysical framework that is associated also with the Pythagorean tradition. Mm -hmm. But you also have uh, Aristotle has a lot to tell us mm -hmm. too that's valuable in terms of the formal cause, the, the final telos, cause, telos. the telos, the, 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 uh, the aim or purpose and end towards which uh, any, anything is moving. So Aristotle gives us a lot of uh, helpful clues, Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, um, Ficino and, and uh, Renaissance uh, thought and so forth. So I, I think, yes, indeed, um, it can be very helpful. And I tried to write The Passion of the Western Mind in such a way that it didn't kind of sum up the, that, that ancient or you know, earlier philosophical position and then just either reject it, saying, well, we know this now and they're wrong about that, I, uh, which would be more what Bertrand Russell, for example, did with his history. I, I tried to enter into each philosophical or religious or scientific perspective uh, from within, look at the world from that point of view, and in a sense uh, describe it in a way that would be comfortable and uh, familiar to the to those people whom I'm, whose work I'm describing, rather than describing it from a kind of modern uh, uh, objectified mm -hmm. and distancing way of doing it. Because I think we don't understand something until we enter into it, until we see it from within. And I found that just incredibly beautiful about your book. And, and the friends of mine who have read it have had the same experience. It, oh, that's great. it was like you were there. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's, it's really a, a wonderful achievement. I sometimes felt that I was. You know, I just, I really, did. I, I would just immerse myself in those thinkers or that era until I felt that I was Kind of, I don't want to say it was like a transmission, but I did feel like I was in a close, almost permeable mm -hmm. connection with that mode of thinking. And um, uh, my wife would say, uh, in those years, this is like you know, 25 years ago, uh, when I'd come in to dinner after a day's work, she said, you know, I, I sometimes it would be like eating with Thomas Aquinas, and another time <laughs> it was like eating with Descartes or with Nietzsche, and you know, who was who was going to be her dinner partner in that night? It is so admirable that that way of doing business. Um, you wrote, <clears throat> toward the close, 
of the, uh, the passion of the Western mind, you wrote, for the deepest passion of the Western mind has been to be reunited with the ground of its own being. And I was interested in the, what Aquinas said, man was an autonomous part of God's universe and his very autonomy allowed him to make his return freely to the source of all. Did you, were you connecting those? Yes, that was in the back of my mind. Yes, yes. Uh, and I think, uh, <clears throat> because I think Aquinas actually is that figure in the high middle ages who feels coming through him this new uh, evolutionary movement that makes possible the modern self, whereby the development of, 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 of human freedom and rational intelligence and engagement with, with the material world and the world of, of history would not be seen as a um, negation of, of duty to God, but would actually be fulfilling God's um, uh, will or, or uh, aspirations for the human being and through the human being because uh, the human being represents that part of the creative, uh, the divine creative principle in which a, a, uh, a flourishing of, of autonomy was, was essential to it rather than a negation of the divine will. So Aquinas makes that um, move possible in such a powerful way, connecting it with you know, basically Greek philosophy and science with um, the gospel and with uh, scholastic theology, and that helps make possible the birth, the burst of the Renaissance and uh, scientific revolution, and the as we move forward through the democratic revolutions and so forth, there's more and more of a development of of the human secular self that takes gives a certain empowerment and emancipation, but also takes the human self away from being immersed in the, in, the, in the ground of being in some sense, which ultimately leads to a kind of alienation with the late modern existential situation. And uh, yet there is still that, and it seems to be part of a larger journey whereby one can go through that alienation towards a, a higher uh, reunion with the ground of being. The early pages of Cosmos and Psyche were not about astrology. They were about historically evolving views of the cosmos. You wrote that since the Copernican Revolution, humanity's view of itself has gone from one of cosmic centrality and unity with the universe to that of being an insignificant speck in a meaningless void. But here's a thought. If we felt at one with the cosmos, or the source of all, shouldn't we feel exalted rather than diminished by the immensity of the universe? It's an idea that borrow, borrows from the Upanishads and Schopenhauer's contemplation of the sublime. Uh, I very much agree with that. So it's to you can take the same vast universe and also mm -hmm. the fact that um, the Earth is no longer the absolute fixed center of the universe, which is on the one hand interpreted by the late modern existentialist as being a, an estrangement from the, uh, from the kind of familiarity and comfort of, of being at the center of the cosmic womb of meaning that let's say Dante had uh, uh, or the ancients and now we're peripheral and this vast universe, its very vastness is a cause for distress. Um, Pascal said I'm terrified by the eternal silence of these infinite spaces. Now what he was especially terrified by uh, is not the infinite spaces, but the eternal silence of those infinite spaces. Mm. And if we then come into the same cosmos of infinite spaces and uh, vastness and are not being at the, at the fixed center, but in fact being a moving you know, planet going around one amongst billions of stars, but we see it with new eyes and we recognize um, our Earth as being a center of cosmic meaning, not the only center and not a fixed center, but a moving center of cosmic meaning in which somehow the planets 
uh, and sun and moon all seem to be uh, cosmically orchestrated in such a way to um, be coinciding consistently with the patterns of human experience, we can then awaken to a, a re-enchanted cosmos just as vast as before, in which we're just as, you know, not at the literal center, and yet we can feel exalted by it because in this vast cosmos, somehow we are a, a focus of cosmic caring in some mm -hmm. sense, of a, kind of, uh, a kind of act of love in a sense that would be giving that kind of attention to our, our earth and even to individuals. Mm -hmm. I was personally stunned by cosmos and psyche as a way of studying history. I think it's the way of the future for historians. It totally empowers the study of history. I've called it the greatest advance in the study of history since Herodotus. My friends, my friends think that I'm ironic or hyper using hyperbole. Uh -huh. I am incautious, but I think there's something very about it, very, very important about the advance to the study of history through the astrological perspective. I, I, I'm glad you see that, and I, you know, I originally was um, working within the realm of um, deepening psychology through astrology and archetypal astrology in particular, and, and discussing it in terms of uh, how much astrology, one way I put it, was um, I have the feeling that textbooks in the future, uh, psychology textbooks of the future, will look back on 20th century psychologists working without the aid of, the, of astrology as being like medieval astronomers working without the aid of the telescope. I now uh, would add to that statement that I think modern, that history textbooks of the future will also look back on 20th century historians working without the aid of astrology as resembling medieval astronomers working without the aid of the telescope. And we, I mean, basically it just, it just opens up the, the, the deeper uh, archetypal rhythms and patternings and cyclical evolutions of, of cultural phenomena in a way that I, mean, I knew our Western cultural and intellectual history pretty well before I started studying astrology. But once I um, did, it, uh, it just opened up on a whole new level, and it's like a, a, a as Stan Gross says, like a Rosetta Stone, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of just opening up the, the deeper um, patterns that connect. And it adds such excitement <coughs> to the facts. Yes. You, the excitement is, is palpable that, in, in this. Um, Can I do yeah, one, yeah, one of yeah, uh, yeah. a doctoral student uh, of mine uh, named uh, Rod O'Neill has uh, coined the term um, uh, archetypal historiography. He believes mm -hmm. that this is op going to open up a whole new field or discipline mm -hmm. uh, of what he called archetypal historiography. And um, uh, so the others are seeing it as you are. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of uh, questions about um, planetary alignments. Uh, I'm interested in the triple conjunction of Jupiter, Neptune, and Chiron that will occur in Aquarius in 2009. Chiron and Neptune are already within orb. Have you considered Chiron in any of your studies? I don't have, uh, I don't have a deep intuitive grasp of Chiron, nor do I have the empirical foundation of, uh, of any substance to be able to uh, draw any conclusions. It seems as if, you know, I think we're each kind of given by the universe a certain task that we're supposed to do mm -hmm. and, and, and it gives us the, the talents that we'll need to, to mm -hmm. uh, either to develop in order to do that task or, you know, to, 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 there, sometimes the talents are just given without even having to develop and they're just there. And for some reason, um, my astrological vision is very penetrating when it comes to understanding the planetary archetypes the, uh, the, the, the aspects, <laughs> midpoints, I have a really good grasp of those and I have a, a, a you know, considerable 
database, as it were, from mm -hmm. looking at history and thousands of individual natal charts, famous people and not famous people. But when it comes to both uh, the the celestial bodies that have been discovered uh, from basically from Chiron on, also the earlier asteroids, uh, I don't have that. Um, it wasn't given to me mm -hmm. somehow to... to uh, fair enough. Right. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, in the year 2010, there will be a very strong T-square alignments of the outer planets, Uranus, Pluto, Saturn, and Jupiter. And as we speak, Uranus and Pluto have entered into the 20-degree orb. Would you comment on how the character of the present time reflects the archetypal qualities of the alignment that is on its way? Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I think the, the, the Uranus-Pluto square will really, it's as it gets to I think 15 degrees, will be when it becomes, that's the outer penumbral edge, and, it's, and then from 10 degrees on is when it's most tight. So we're, we're just at the very, very beginning of that square that will get much stronger from, you know, really late this year, 2008 through 2011, it'll be moving towards exact with the T-square to Saturn. 2012, it becomes exact. And then right through the 2000 teens, that square will still be happening. So we're looking at basically the next 13 years or so, we'll have the, that tremendous intensification of the Promethean energies uh, for radical change, liberation, but also liberation of the will to power, which has a shadow potential. Um, and uh, so there's, we're, we're looking at a sustained period of roughly a decade and a half where the, the um, social, political, ecological, no doubt, uh, economic um, dynamics of the of the world will be in a fair amount of turmoil and potentially powerful creative change, um, but there's no question that between 2008 and 2011, when Saturn gets into the T square, mm -hmm. that's when the um, the eye of the needle will be. That's where our threshold will be. I think where we will most need to deal with the great conflicts between. Um, mm -hmm change and resistance to change. Mm -hmm. uh, conservative and, and liberal, but even reactionary versus radical will probably mm -hmm. be more like it. Like the mid-60s when Saturn was opposite Uranus and Pluto. Um, I remember and, well. Yeah, the, the, the generation gap, the culture wars, the, the splitting of the country in many different ways, uh, youth, um, race, uh, and so forth. There are many ways in which it was taking place. We, um, I think we can already see a lot of the, even in the last year, there's been an intensification of the, the kinds of movements that we're likely to see get much stronger over the next few years. We've started to see mass demonstrations by, let's say in the, in the U.S., of, of like the Hispanic, uh, the Latino demonstrations that they were themselves calling it a new civil rights movement. Um, you see uh, things like also in, in Paris and France, the big um, riots and mass demonstrations with Paris is like a kind of, uh, as, as soon as they get into, as soon as one of those Uranus-Pluto alignments happen, they go to the barricades <laughs> in Paris. They're like the, uh, they're like the canary in the gold mine. They're the early, they, right on the front edge usually. And they have a script that says, throw up the barricades. Exactly. <laughs> We've got to keep the tradition up. It's like the, the, the planets are there. Uh, and they, they do it with such clock-like regularity. So anyway, we're seeing the signs of it. Um, now, I think it's the, it's the ecological um, uh, crisis, really, that is probably going to produce some of the most significant destabilizing of other structures, economic, social, political, that will require a great um, change of human heart as well as will and uh, operating assumptions in these next few years. So much will depend on, on you know, how f for full of foresight and wisdom we are and how well we can negotiate the, the legitimate claims of both the uh, impulse for the new and change on the one hand and the uh, awareness that it's important to keep certain structural 
uh, foundations intact because they have value mm -hmm. and not just throw over everything. We've got to somehow um, uh, walk that tightrope with, with mm -hmm. perhaps a little more wisdom than we were able to do during the 60s when it was a, a, a perhaps a little more unrestrained. Uh, yeah. And uh, <coughs> I'd like to hazard a prediction that your own work is going to come into the fore at that time. Uh, it's going to announce itself with the, your own Jupiter-Pluto opposition. Then we're going to have Jupiter-Uranus and Jupiter-Pluto. Yes, uh -huh. And yeah. the major yeah. parts of your book, you referred, you referred at one point to the Jupiter-Uranus yes. opposition. Yeah. I think that diacr diachronically or in your own development, it could make sense. That this would yeah. be coming, uh, well, we'll, coming we'll, through. We'll see. Um, the, uh, the, the Jupiter Uranus uh, uh, conjunction that will take place then will happen uh, basically what 2010 into right. a little into the beginning of 2011, right. and I wrote most of Cosmos and Psyche during the opposition right. of 2002 to four. That's what I was referring to. Yes, exactly. So you're, you're, you're quite right. And what's interesting is I also had the initial astrological kind of epiphany in my own life mm -hmm. under the Jupiter-Uranus opposition of 1976. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a, a kind of pattern right there of um, my writing uh, two cycles later mm -hmm. and then and this, so yeah. who knows I think right? this, is a, this is a big time. We'll, we'll watch for yeah. it. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask a very large question. At the end of an interview on Canadian radio, you said that you were optimistic about the human project, that we will make it. I'm wondering what success for humanity would amount to. Do you think there is an omega point for human development? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, by make it in that context where the CBC interviewer was you know, basically reflecting that uh, anxiety that is widespread now about the future of humanity and, and even apocalyptic fears. And while I think we are definitely in a, in a race uh, between, you know, H.G. Wells said we're in a race between education and catastrophe. And one could also put it, if we look at this larger process that's unfolding as being perhaps an initiation, uh, not only an education, but an initiation into a new way of relating to the cosmos and a new form of being human um, that is no longer everything's man versus nature or man's alone in the cosmos with his intelligence and purposefulness and so forth, but instead a much more of a participatory, co-creative relationship to the whole. If we understand the human um, project right now in, as an initiatory threshold that we're crossing, then you could say we're kind of in a race between initiation and catastrophe. Uh, and I, even if crises happen of, of considerable gravity, um, I think there will be a <clears throat> response in the human community that will meet those crises in such a way, partly you know, inspired by by, from higher sources of wisdom that we will need, um, I think that there will be a response that could, much like a person who goes through a near-death experience, re-changes their life values in fundamental ways to live a more um, wise mode of life. Um, I think that could very much, very well happen to the human community. And I think that if we think about how much the universe has lavished on the human species and on the earth community with such care, uh, I don't think it would simply be abandoned uh, in some sense. I think we're, uh, I think larger, larger forces are at work than we can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while I have a certain amount of confidence in human beings, I also know we're very fallible and can really uh, screw up in major ways. Uh, and, but I have a great confidence in the in the wisdom of the larger whole, which can take even great falls and great um, errors and turn them into openings to larger uh, 
positive things that could unfold that would not have otherwise unfolded. Yeah. Um, that sort of segues into something that I was talking to Carolyn Casey about last night, and she said that I might ask you about your okay. opinions on it. It's about the trickster. Um, Kierkegaard said all existential truths are ironic and are true precisely in proportion as they are ironic. And that seems to resonate with the trickster. Um, do you think that we can find the trickster writ large in history, such as when we find improbable or bizarre people elevated to power, say in the late Roman Empire, uh, Caligula, Caligula, Nero, Claudius was a bizarre in his own right. Not to mention our own time. Well, I wasn't going to, but if you don't mind. Um, and that, that seemed in the longer run of history to have had a logical place in, a, in development. Um, I would like to take some comfort in the face of bitter ironies and kind of a an assimilation of the idea of the trickster writ large. I just would like to hear your response. I think, I think you're putting your finger on it uh, quite, quite well. Um, I mean, it, <clears throat> when I set out to write The Passion of the Western Mind, which is a kind of overview of, uh, of the interior history of, of Western civilization, I didn't have a pre-given program that I was writing it according to. I didn't know the plot, so to speak. I just wanted to do a, a, a faithful mm -hmm. job. And uh, But as it unfolded, it was constantly with a sense of the, the paradox of things, the irony and the paradox with which unexpected consequences grew out of um, developments and somebody like something like the Reformation would come in where Luther and others are wanting this to happen and in the course of them succeeding, they actually produce something that they would never have wanted to have yeah. happen, which is the birth of, of a secular civilization out of their um, extremely religiously intense movement. And that's kind of tricky. It's, it is a, a perfect expression yeah. of the trickster. Mm -hmm. And the trickster seems to be always present at, at any creative moment. Mm -hmm. the creativity and the trickster go hand in hand. And so, I yes, I think um, we can pretty much depend on the trickster being present in the future, and which is one reason why uh, predicting the future is a um, fairly foolish task, and all we can do is, um, I think we can get a sense looking at the planetary alignments of the, the basic archetypal dynamics that will be at work, but as to how specifically it's going to come out, um, perhaps a prophet uh, who has some unusual uh, clairvoyant insight into the future might be able to uh, tell us something, and some have, but I think just on the basis of the astrological perspective, we, what we are given through that is extraordinary insight into the archetypal dynamics, but not into the specific way it's going to come, mm -hmm. come through. And we can feel the presence of the trickster when things get genuinely weird and in uh, in our circumstances. Yes. Um, I want to go over to Kant and Schopenhauer and his idealism. I've, I've had a, a long, long struggle with idealism, with Berkeley and such, uh, and recently reading Schopenhauer, um, he noted how Kant in the first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason had a sentence about uh, if you take the experiencer away from reality, then there is no reality, everything disappears. Um, and then he struck that from later editions, and finally it was reinserted into the final editions. He was struggling with it too. Exactly, right. Um, I've made peace with it in my own way as follows, and I like your comment. The idea of removing consciousness from reality is a non-starter for, for a question that consciously, consciousness is inextricably a part of cosmos, and taking it out is a non-issue. Yes. Like taking circularity away from the circle, you just, you just, that's a non-starter for a, yes. for a thought experiment. That's very well put, and um, you know I think it's uh, among modern philosophers it's, that's been approached. That problem has been approached by a number of them, but. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead has been especially insightful in that way, and, and what 
he would call the the non-starter that you're referring to, he refers to it as uh, basically the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you'll, you, you, you probably are familiar with what he did, but... Um, Just a little. Our, our He's very hard. Yeah. <laughs> but if, he, uh, if you start with um, science in the modern world mm -hmm. and adventures of ideas, right. and then go to process and reality, it's an easier sequence of doing it. And he's, he's quite, quite um, profound in recognizing that you, just, you simply can't abstract out of the equation the, the subject, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and as soon as we start talking about reality in that much more authentic way, mm -hmm. then s certain of the philosophical problems that were created mm -hmm. by the Cartesian split, uh, uh, that um, different, whether it's Kantian or Hume and others, uh, created, um, he actually has some things right on Berkeley in particular that you find, I think that's in Science in the Modern World, um, that you might find very helpful. Because mm -hmm. he admires Berkeley and also um, goes beyond him and clarifies things in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in the roots of some of these ideas in Heraclitus, where he talked about the logos, mm -hmm. in which all opposites were one. Yes. Um, and then we found this development through Parmenides and Plato and, and so forth, and then in the, the Stoics, and then and in the Taoists, uh, essentially yeah. the same idea. And I'm impressed, well, by the fact that the now is all we've ever had or all we ever will have, and that that and and by the fact that time and space are not properties of the ultimate reality or the the reality behind appearances, the noumenal world. And it grabs me as a double Pisces most profoundly when, say, reading the Shakespeare's 116th sign under certain circumstances. I'm so absolutely moved to tears that I feel the absolute immediacy across time and space of another soul mm -hmm. that we, we get to that, that numinous reality behind appearances, behind opposites, behind separations. And I was I was loving what I found in Schopenhauer in his contemplation of the sublime and his definition of the sublime which he was elaborating from Kant. And I'm fascinated by the fact that when I experience the most absolute sublime moments like that, I am instantly moved to tears that that threatening thing becomes the most joyous thing I can know. And it seems like the, the closest. What, what was the threatening thing? Th the threatening, the threatening thing of, well, the sublime comes like at at death or remembering my mm -hmm. father, and and being moved to tears. I consider that a blessing when that happens. The sublime and is not a, just about the beauty; it's about beauty of a different sort. Yes, yeah. Beauty of a rugged or even threatening kind, where yeah. one has a special. Uh, perspective. Yes, there's a kind of awe. Yeah. Uh, so that, that noumenal world that that got buried, or that that, that was there was a place you didn't go. I think uh, is 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 coming back. I, I want to be a noumenologist, not a phenomenologist. Yes, yeah. You know, it's interesting. There's a word uh, that comes from a different root called the numinous mm -hmm. that Rudolf Otto describes the numinous, which is the holy or the sacred. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms just like what you're talking about, that it, the numinous is something that can move someone to tears, it can be so, so powerful that it can, it can be uh, awesome, awe-inspiring, awful, terrifying even, or you know, profoundly um, healing, and so it has different aspects, but uh, there, you, you certainly are, I think, in your experience of the numinal is um, allowing you to see through the limitations that Kant had put on mm -hmm. the human subject. and you, you We can get to the noumenon. Yes. We do get to the noumenon. We live in it. Yes. It's, it's our being. Yeah, I agree. And uh, one other, at least one other thing. I don't think I could have written the book without doing some of that. Yes. Um, on, on the question of free will and such, uh, here's some related words. Well, we've got determinism, which is threatening to human dignity. But then we've got words like destiny, 
vocation, mission, purpose in life, these are all ennobling and elevating words. Destiny. Mm -hmm. and, right. and astrology is a, about destiny and such, it's such. And these are kind of things not obviously chosen by the individual, and yet they're uplifting and exalting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. You know, some of it's, it's interesting how you can take like fate and destiny. Um, one's got kind of a more Saturnian cast, and the other is a little more of a Jupiterian yeah, cast. Fate is it? kind of in between determinism and destiny for me. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, I wanted to coin a word, feel more as lover of. Of fate, but I found that Nietzsche, Nietzsche beat it. Done it he right, beat yeah. me. Yeah. Am amor fati. Yeah. Amor fati. Right. Um, right. And yeah, he he, he was uh, extraordinary in that way. Um, I I think you're right. Astrology has a shadow potential to fall into a deterministic and fatalistic mode, and it has done so in different eras and in different individuals. Even to this day, I think some astrologers. Um, uh, are too easily uh, prone to give readings that limit the the potential of the person they're giving the reading for by saying this means that, or as a result of you having this aspect, uh, um, we you you shouldn't go in this direction, or don't don't uh, follow, don't I wouldn't give this relationship much. Uh, chance of succeeding or something like that. That's a that's a that's a deterministic or fatalistic. I think misreading of the mm -hmm. astrological uh, tradition. Um, but astrology does have also this potential for n nourishing a sense of what of actualizing the potential in somebody's birth chart in their life, and in that sense, uh, allowing their their destiny to be fulfilled, their true nature to, to um, blossom, what Hillman calls the acorn theory uh, in his excellent book, um, The Soul's Code, and what, you know, it's, it's very Aristotelian. Yeah, I was about to say, it sounds, it sounds like he got something from Aristotle he did, there. yeah, it was quite mm -hmm. conscious. Would you like to add anything else, uh, Jim? I, I think we've pretty much... Can I ask you yeah, 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 by all means. Oh, my brain's are good. <laughs> yes. Um, you. In your book, when I read that, uh, you know, you said that about the archetypes. The most fascinating chapter was on the archetypes for me. And you said they were fluid, evolving, multivalent, and have a participatory nature. Um, the valency of the archetype, you know. Mm -hmm. To me, it seems like, you know, Aries can express that at like a lower level, like a daredevil, risk taker, adrenaline junkie. But once that sort of evolves, they start moving toward like the warrior, they find a cause. And then that, once you lead a bunch of warriors for a while, you become the leader. And then the leader sort of evolves into like a true, once you lead a while, you get your own little pioneering spirit. And that leads to maybe a spiritual flow of like the hero archetype, you mm -hmm. know, the highest spiritual expression of that. So I was, what you're set me off thinking like, well, if they have valency, they must have these different levels. Like with Aquarius, I was working with, um, you know, the, the rebel nonconformist starts inventing and then wants to be the reformer once they invent and then starts uh you know being humanitarian and then finally the cosmic genius you know like mm -hmm. descends yeah so i was working with that um do you think that would describe uh, say like a, a rising numinosity of the archetype that kind of uh it let's say it's a it's a, a rising um Quality, uh, it's, it's moving more and more to towards the noble, um, you know, uh, potential. Numinosity can actually, I, I think, it's also perhaps a, a more uh, profound form of numinosity. However, the numinous can possess someone to do very, uh, like a person who is just so full of uh, a, a, of, a, of a low level but powerful archetypal dynamism, like, like, like Hitler was, really had a numinous um, charge around him, and, and so much so that he led one of the most sophisticated and profound cultures of, of Europe into catastrophe, and, and the world into catastrophe, because of that, that, that numinosity. It's, it's very compelling, and it isn't always um, benign. So 
uh, I don't know if I would use the word numinous to distinguish the higher levels, uh, but um, I think you have to put your finger on the uh, kind of spectrum that I was uh, gesturing towards between noble and ignoble, or uh, more you know, profound, developed, cultivated expressions of something versus more um, you know, undeveloped and, and uh, grosser forms. It just seems like the daredevil Aries would be more apt to the destructive side yes. of the shadow. Whereas the hero would be more apt to like the arrogance of the shadow, you know. The that's that's right. Because the 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 daredevil uh, at the beginning uh, often is very full of himself and is more self-oriented. While the the the, the true hero has, tr in a sense, tr has um, gone through a self-submission, a self-transcendence, in which um, she or he is, uh, in a sense, placing their being in the service of a, of a larger whole for the future, for a new life, for a new being, uh, often with great, I mean, that's what genuine heroism is. Well, came, the way I developed this is I was thinking about the five-pointed Chinese star and the elements, and I was thinking, so I could call these stages valencies of the archetype, maybe? Yeah, uh, val by valence I mean um, mul uh, m <clears throat> multiple meanings, uh -huh. multiple modes by which the archetype can express itself. Um, one more thing. Did, did you want to have a picture taken? Yeah, oh, yeah. In. Okay. We did pictures. I, will, I have one more uh, picture, Mr. Tynus. Question. You um, take this landscape, or you don't have a landscape right here, if I may, sir. Oh, sure. Yeah. In uh, in 575 BC, there was the conjunction of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto and Taurus. Right. Perfect which you, know, you, you had. Play? Oh yes, you do have. Play. Wow. You had <laughs> things like you know <laughs> Lao Tzu was writing the Tao, and Buddhism was well, popping up, and get one of the two. you know the yeah. Greeks. The Greeks are having their heyday. And right. What what was there anything else that, I mean, can you talk about that in general so for people to know about? Um, did, did you happen to read, uh, it's, at my, it's 515, so I kind of need to go to okay. my, uh, but did, I, just to, well, you probably did read that chapter. Yeah, I, I just wanted the people, yeah. people to hear right. about it on the table. Basically, right across all the, and there's only one triple conjunction in recorded history uh, of the outer three planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And when that occurred, which in its wider range, it began in the 590s, got closer and closer to the 580s and 70s, this is BC or BCE, and went then finally through the 560s. And that larger, you know, roughly, you know, third of a century, uh, is the period when every major civilization that we know of had an enormous spiritual and cultural awakening that we are still living the consequences of the the um, whether it was the Buddha in India or Confucius and, and, and Lao Tzu and, and Taoism and so forth in China uh, Jainism in India the in in Greece you had the beginning of the great philosophical tradition with Thales and Pythagoras you have the beginning of uh, Greek drama with uh, Thespis and Greek poetry uh, through um, uh, Sappho and you have in the in the Judaic uh, Hebrew tradition, you have this tremendous uh, transformation of the uh, image of God that takes place uh, through the prophets uh, um, Ezekiel and Second Isaiah. Uh, it's it's a truly extraordinary period, and even it seems that Zoroaster may well have been around that period. And also the uh, we, we, it's a little uncertain, but many scholars. Uh, center his activity at that time, and then also uh, the Orphic tradition in in, uh, in the larger Greek world as well is certainly reaching a uh, an extraordinary creative moment. So um, it, this is a a period when simul there, the Plutonic empowerment on a deep evolutionary level is uh, impelling the on the one hand the Neptunian principle of uh, of the um, religious and spiritual imagination and artistic imagination with the Uranian Promethean awakening, the breakthrough to the new, all of which has this revolutionary effect on consciousness that uh, really has transformed the world from then on. And for those people who have studied these cycles through history and then come upon this one time when all three of the planets came into a triple conjunction and see how absolutely unprecedented and, and and, and unique, uh, the, a period of historical transformation that took place at that time, it, 
just seeing that has a kind of numinosity that many people uh, get kind of shivers from because it's it's so extraordinary. Thanks. Okay. <laughs>